Welcome to our next lesson uh, connected to the physics of pneumatics and hydraulics. Today we're going to talk a little bit about vacuums. Now most people when they hear the word vacuum instantly think of that device that we use to clean. And of course a vacuum cleaner is definitely one of the most common uses that we have for a vacuum. A vacuum obviously is something that sucks up things uh, through a tube and then processes and filters out that air. So what is a vacuum itself though? How does a vacuum cleaner work? Well when we began this block we started talking about the most fundamental part of air pressure that we experience which is our breathing process. We learned of course that our diaphragm in pulling down on our lungs creates more space in our lungs. When we create more space in a contained area, we create a vacuum. We cause the pressure inside our lungs, in this case, to become lower than the pressure of the air outside of us. Well, we have a word for the air outside of us. It is called atmospheric pressure. And atmospheric pressure refers to the pressure we are experiencing from the air around us in the space that we're in at the moment. Atmospheric pressure, of course, as we've discussed before, changes based on where you're at. If you are at sea level, the atmospheric pressure around you is going to be greater than the atmospheric pressure around you if you were at the top of a mountain. So elevation does affect atmospheric pressure. It is different. But what we do know is that the atmospheric pressure, wherever you're at, is going to be a constant and a vacuum then means that something is lower than that atmospheric pressure. Well, let's look at one example, a very simple example that we have dealing with creating a vacuum. It would be your simple air pump that you might use to pump up a ball, or you could use it for a bicycle tire too. It's a very simple bike pump. Well, how these pumps work is fairly simple. There is a plunger inside a tube, a cylinder, and there is a way to move that plunger in and out of the tube. And of course, every time that we pull that plunger out, we have created more space inside the tube. By creating that extra space inside the tube, the air around in the atmospheric pressure is drawn into that vacuum and fills that chamber. And of course, when we press on our pump, we are now pressurizing the air. And by doing that, we can, we can squeeze that air through a narrow opening and of course, force that air into either our bike tire or the ball that we're trying to inflate. So we remember once again that in vacuums, we know that higher pressure air will always seek out a lower pressure area. And so when we create a vacuum, we are creating lower pressure and thereby air will go into it. Now, why do we call it atmospheric pressure? Well, because it comes from our atmosphere. The earth is of course surrounded by an atmosphere, which is a large containment of air around our planet. So that would tell us then that outside of our atmosphere, we don't have the same kind of atmospheric pressure. And in fact, outer space is an area outside of our planet that has very, very, very low pressure. In fact, is kind of a giant vacuum. And that's because there's really only a few hydrogen atoms per cubic meter when we get out into space. Here on Earth, of course, we have a lot of different gases concentrated into our atmosphere. And of course, the closer we get to sea level, the more pressure that all provides. But if we go out into space, we find that there's no pressure like that at all. And so, of course, that's why in all of our classic movies where somebody is out in space and they're in a spaceship and there's a hole or a breach in the spaceship, it creates a giant suction and everything inside your pressurized spaceship would get sucked into the outside, sucked into the great vacuum of space. So that's actually pretty factually accurate that that would happen. If you were to breach something and you don't have the right pressure, which of course astronauts will go outside in a pressurized suit for that reason, uh, if we breach something like that, then of course we're going out into the vacuum of space. Well, 
people realized that there are a lot of other uses for vacuums. And in fact, all the way back in the 1600s, a student of Galileo realized that he could create a vacuum artificially. And his vacuum that he created during that period of time was one in which he was trying to understand uh, the density of air. And what he did was he took a long tube, quite like a test tube, closed at one end and open on the other, and he filled that tube with mercury, the liquid metal. And when he turned that tube over and stuck it into a bowl of mercury, the top end, the closed end, suddenly provided a gap. And that gap was a vacuum. So contained within that glass tube, he realized that he could create the first vacuum. It is out of that that this same person figured out the idea of barometric pressure. And so when we learned about uh, weather patterns, we realized that weather has everything to do with air pressure, high and low pressure moving from one to the other. Well, this man realized that we could measure that outside pressure by the vacuum he had created in his tube. And so, in fact, he created the first uh, ability to read barometric pressure. And he found out that by moving that around, the pressure was once again different if he was down at, at sea level. And if he went up to the top of the mountain, he would see a difference. So that also became the core of being able to measure altimeters or using altimeters, a way to measure how high you are in elevation. So the next step that scientists began to come up with in the use of vacuums was the idea that if we're going to do something like use electricity in a confined space, we realized that to properly allow electricity to flow, we have to create a vacuum space for that electricity to work in. And so the earliest light bulbs, as people were first figuring out how to create an incandescent light bulb, they had to start off with figuring out how electricity can run up one wire, run across a filament, a very thin strip of material, and it changed over the years, and then run back down a wire so it completes a total circuit. Well. Scientists for years tried to work on what should that filament be made of and also what should be contained in the glass of the light bulb itself. And they found that when they sucked by pressurizing and by using a pump, when they sucked all of the air out of the glass chamber, they found that the light bulb was able to last a lot longer and be a lot more successful. Eventually, they found that they could even pull the air out of the light bulb and then inject in a different type of a gas that might work even better. Now another type of lighting in which we would have the same principle would be a neon light. In a neon light we have a long extended tube. Neon lights even though we look at them and they can be broken up into different letters, a neon light is actually just one long twisted tube. Parts of it are colored and parts of it are not. When they black out part of the tube, it creates a gap between letters. But the same principle is there as our other light, which is they have sucked out all of the air inside this glass tube, and then they've replaced the air that they pulled out with a different gas. In this case, the gas is neon. And when neon is put into an enclosed tube that has had a vacuum to suck out the other gases, when we add an electric charge to one side of it, the electricity will run through the neon gas and cause it to light up. And so it is through this process that neon lights are able to work. So once again, the value of the vacuum has been shown. Well, this was all done back in the early 20th century, coming up with light bulbs and using electricity to make lights. We now have very different light bulbs rather than the incandescent bulb. And one of the reasons is an incandescent bulb ends up losing about 95% of the energy that we put into it. It loses that as heat. So really only 5% of the electricity that we use on an old incandescent light bulb is going to turn into light. The rest of it is just turning into heat and is essentially being lost. So we have figured out how to make bulbs out of compact fluorescent 
and we're even moving into new technologies like light emitting diodes or LED. All of these are really working on a similar process that without the vacuum uh, sealing idea we would not have been able to make these successfully. And in fact it was this very technology that starting in the late 1930s and moving through the 40s during World War II a group of scientists figured that they could crack the code that the German army had been using to send uh, secret messages. And in trying to do so, they were trying to break down a very, very complicated number system. And in order to break down this complicated number system, they came up with some of the earliest computers. And the first computers were actually done in a way where they were taking small vacuum tubes, meaning little glass cylinders that they were able to suck the oxygen out and basically create a vacuum inside and therefore use the two little plugs that these things had to be able to create electrical signals or impulses. Well, these early vacuum tubes were the beginning of computing because they had found that by turning them on and off in a series of switches, these vacuum tubes were able to allow them to conduct a huge number of uh, calculations at one time. The vacuum tubes stayed a part of computing for quite a while while the computers were still really large. But of course, just like the incandescent light bulb, over time we found that they weren't as efficient and they broke down way too quickly. And so, of course, we eventually moved our computing from vacuum tubes over to things like silicone transistors. But without that time of using the vacuum, early computing would not have been successful. Now, our last addition today for talking about vacuums is, of course, the vacuum cleaner, which most of us, again, associate with that word. So how does a vacuum cleaner work? Well, Today we're going to start off by looking at a shop vac or a shop vacuum, standard that most people have in either their houses or shops or a variety of different needs. In a shop vac, which all vacuums have basically the same premise, the shop vac has a large containment area, a big sort of cylinder, and it has a tube that runs out that is our hose that we're going to suck materials up through. We can put any different variety of uh, fixtures on the end of our hose. And of course, with all the understanding we have now of pressure, we would know that the smaller the opening, the more powerful the suction will occur. The larger the opening, it won't be quite as strong. Now, the main part of this vacuum is housed in the top part of your shop vac. And of course, it's a fairly simple machine. We have a fan that is operated by an electric motor. When we plug our shop vac in and turn it on, the electric motor is going to now start spinning the fan. And of course, the fan is oriented so that it is going to pull air rather than push air. And in this case, our fan is attached to a filter system. A big filter sits at the bottom of that so that as the fan pulls the air with a great deal of strength, it will pull that air through a filter. It always has an exhaust part because that air has to go somewhere or else we would just be pressurizing another tank. And a vacuum is not there to store air, it's there to essentially clean air. So the vacuum motor begins, the fan goes into operation, and it creates enough suction that we can pull things in through the hose. As the hose runs through, heavier dust is going to settle or materials will settle down at the bottom. But finer dust is going to move up and get caught in the filter system. That air, after passing through the filter, is going to work its way out and then be sent out as an exhaust port. And for this reason, most shop vacs, you can actually reverse your hose and the exhaust port and you could turn your vacuum into a blower. So I hope this helps you understand the idea of how vacuums work and their importance in our society.